One of the, one of the biggest things that we see in the church today is a real clear divide between Christians who are open and honest about fetal and mental illness and those who are more pharisaical and sadduceical about it. I think what we've done in the church is we've either realized that part of living in a fallen universe is we have physical and mental illness. And those people that embrace that, I think, have a more healthy view of life. Those that pretend that that's not an issue in the church are just blind. You're listening to The Bible Revealed, a podcast empowering you to understand the Bible and transform your faith. If you've ever felt intimidated or unsure about reading your Bible, then this show is for you. So get ready to be encouraged, equipped, and strengthened in your faith. And now, here's your host, Pastor Phil Ayers. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. My name is Phil, and I'm so glad that you're listening. This is a podcast that is designed to help you feel more confident about your Bible and to help you grow spiritually. That's the goal, and I want to be an encouragement to you. And so if there's anything we can ever do for you, a different way to encourage you or different content that you would like to hear, please feel free to reach out. You can send me an email at BibleRevealedPodcast at gmail.com. That's BibleRevealedPodcast at gmail.com. On today's show, we've got a couple of things. We'll take care of an Ask a Pastor question. Got a good one coming up there. And then I recorded an interview last week with a good friend of mine, a guy named John Thurman. He does a lot of things. You'll hear all about that. But we had a conversation about suicide, and that this is something that has come up a few times in my life. It's a difficult topic. Uh, but recently, you may have been made aware of the suicide of uh, a fairly prominent Christian leader named Jared Wilson. And in the Christian circles, this caused uh, a ripple effect among people, you know, talking about a mental illness in the Christian community, talking about suicide in the Christian community, talking about our leaders, our pastors. And so I wanted to have a good conversation with John about this because this is one of the things he specializes in. But first, I want to give you something for free. I did write a book. It's almost been two years now. Uh, it's called Flannel Graph Jesus, and it is my way to help people understand the real character of who Jesus is. The reason it's called Flannel Graph Jesus is because when I was a kid, we used to learn about Jesus in Sunday school, and they used these things called flannel graphs, or some people called them felt boards. Maybe you remember. It was sort of a board up on a tripod, and it was covered with a felt-like substance, and they had these little paper characters that had, I don't know, some kind of tacky material on the back, but you would put the paper characters on the paper, and that's how would you, you would learn the Bible stories. Now, for me, I always paid special attention to the paper character of Jesus because he was so clean. He was, uh, you know, white. He was a very nice looking person, very uh, friendly and happy. And, you know, the problem with that, obviously Jesus is those things, but the problem with that is it just shows one side of Jesus. And so I embarked on a teaching series about the real character of Jesus. For example, the fact that he was tough and that he was a little bit rebellious and that he was kind of funny, if you understand some of the things he said in context. So I would like to give you a copy of that book right now. I have a deal through Audible, and you can get the book for free just by trying Audible out for 30 days. No commitment necessary. Audible is an app that you put on your phone or your computer. You can listen to all kinds of audiobooks. If you would like, you can try the service out. You get my book for free. If you want to continue, it's only $14.95 a month, and that includes a free audiobook every single month, plus deep discounts on every other audiobook. Now, if you don't want to continue with the service, you can cancel any time, and you get to keep all of the books that you bought, including the one that you got from me for free. If you want to check that out, go to philairs.me slash free book now. That's philairs.me slash free book now. How do you spell Ayers? A-Y-R-E-S. Before we move on, let's talk to our producer, Dylan, and see if we've got anything new from a listener as far as a question to answer. Yeah, Chris has got a question. It's got some big words in here, so I'll do my best. How do former atheists and agnostics adjust to the alienation of family and friends who reject your newfound faith? And how do you discipline yourself in Christ of former non-believer ways? That's a good question. It sounds like... Chris may have been an atheist or agnostic at one point in time, and he feels um, a little alienated by his family. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. It sounds like maybe he grew up in a family of non-believers and came to Christ at some point, maybe. Yeah. Either way, it's a great question. I'll do my best to answer. There's a passage in the Bible that actually answers both of Chris's questions at the same time. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 2. So Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, is writing this to the church, and he's writing to a group of people who are Christians, and so obviously they don't fit into culture. They stand out because of their lives and because of the way that they live. And here's what he says in verse 11, chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Then he says in verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So that second verse essentially answers Chris's first question. You know, when you're living around people who don't believe in Jesus, who are not following Christ and they don't, they don't have that in their life, it is easy for them to look at you and to want to mock you or to write you off as crazy, even if it's your family. By the way, I want to point something out. If you look in the Bible, even Jesus' own family didn't believe in him for a time. That's a mind-blowing concept, that they grew up with the Son of God but even didn't believe in him. So you're in good company if your family thinks that you're crazy for following Jesus. But here's what you do. Now, obviously, there might be a time for you to share your faith with your family verbally, to invite them to church, and so on. But the most important thing you can do is live in such a way that the people around you, they cannot accuse you of doing anything wrong because they see that your life changed. And then they will glorify God. Your best testimony is simply the way you act. St. Francis said, Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. I've always loved that quote because the idea is, you know, your actions speak louder than words. If a picture paints a thousand words, then your actions write a book. And when people see you living in a different way and when they see your life changed and when they see you handling adversity through the power of the Holy Spirit and and, uh, being a part of a Christian community and they see joy and contentment in your life, even if you're struggling, that means something and it matters. Now, to answer the second part of that question, I think the first verse we read answers that question. How do you abstain from that? Well, you need to understand that you're waging a war. He says, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You're fighting a battle against sin. Jesus Christ fought that battle. He died on the cross for us. His blood cleanses us from sin, but we do continue to fall short of the mark. And understand that the war is being fought more on a spiritual level than it is being fought on a physical level. Now, obviously, there are things that are tempting for us. And I would say, you know, that's kind of like a war. A good example would be, you know, if you're somebody who struggles with alcoholism, If you want to make the battle easier, don't go into a liquor store. Or if you're somebody who struggles with pornography, make sure that your computer is, you know, has some uh, filters on it or make sure that you've canceled your HBO subscription or whatever it is that leads you into trouble. So there's, there's that level that we have to sort of fight here on the ground. But the war is really being waged spiritually, just like it says in Ephesians, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities, this idea that Satan would love to cause you to sin and may tempt you uh, or may accuse you of doing wrongdoing. So understand it's a war and understand that it's a war you can't win on your own. It's a war that Jesus fights with you and for you. So that's how I would answer that question. Thanks for asking. I really appreciate that, Chris. I hope it helps. If you have a question that you would like for me to try and answer, you can do that by sending an email to BibleRevealedPodcast at gmail.com. You can also call and leave your question on our voice line, 616-275-0239. That's 616-275-0239. In a second, we're going to play that interview that I recorded a while ago, but first I want to just remind you that you're a writer, 
A lot of people don't think that they're a writer. They think, oh, I, I've never written a book or I don't write a blog. But, you know, you do write lots of things. You write emails, you write Facebook posts, you comment on other people's posts. No matter what you say, you're a writer. Now, if you're like me, you probably have a little bit, a, bit of anxiety about where to put commas and where to put hyphens and how to spell things. And I've got a secret weapon that can save you. It's helped me. It's called Grammarly. Grammarly will check all of that kind of stuff for you, and it checks even more than that. So imagine writing an email or writing a, a Facebook post or anything and not having to worry about punctuation or spelling ever again. And there's even more. If you sign up for a premium account, Grammarly will actually check for context and sentence structure. It makes suggestions on stronger word choices, and it will even base all that on the style of writing that you're trying to achieve. So I have the premium account. I love it. It's worth it. Plans start at $12 a month. And if you want to try it out, you can go to philairs.me slash Grammarly today to learn how to take the anxiety out of writing and sound like a pro every time you write a blog post, an email, a comment, or even your next book. Check it out. It's philairs.me slash Grammarly. As I mentioned before, last week I had a chance to speak with a friend of mine regarding the suicide of Jared Wilson. It's an interesting conversation, uh, hopefully helpful if you are someone who's struggled with uh, thoughts of harming yourself, or maybe you have a friend who's gone through that. It's always a difficult, difficult uh, situation. At the end of the interview, I also give some resources on where people can find some help. And uh, if you're one of those individuals, even though this might be a difficult podcast to listen to or an interview, I would encourage you to listen and to reach out for help if you need it. I think one of the lies the devil tells us is that we're on our own and that nobody understands how you feel and that people will judge you if you speak out or if you are honest about the way you feel. And that's simply not true. Even though it feels that way, the truth is there are people who care and people who will help you with those feelings and thoughts, and John Thurman is one of those people. So without further ado, here's the interview I recorded last week with my friend John. On the phone with me is my good friend John Thurman. He is a licensed professional counselor, a best-selling author, a speaker and trainer, and he is a retired Army chaplain. Thanks for being on The Bible Revealed, John. Hey, great, great to be here with Phil. It's really an honor for me. Well, we, we it's funny. We've known each other, it seems like, through Facebook for, you know, maybe a year or two, but we actually just met last week, it, although it feels like I've known you forever. Hey, and the truth, yeah, we just met last week in Franklin. It was good finally meeting my brother from another mother. <laughs> It was true. It was a great time, and I, I was really uh, inspired, and I, I love meeting all those people. And I said that, um, you know, this last week, and I said, oh, I've got to have you on my podcast, but little did I know that uh, some things would happen in the, um, in the Christian world that would, would sort of shake, uh, shake up the Christian world so much, and that is the sudden and tragic death of Jared Wilson, who was, uh, you know, a pastor at a very large church and somebody who spoke on suicide prevention. He took his life just early this week, and I said, I've got to call my friend John and see if he'll be on the podcast and talk about it. Now, when you hear about something like this happening, what is your first reaction? You know, Phil, my, my first reaction is really a, a, a very profound sense of sadness. Um, this is something that's been going on for years. I know recently when Kay Warren, Kay and Rick Warren's son, the suicide, they brought it to the front again. And finally, the church began to have some very serious conversations about uh, suicide, suicide awareness, and suicide prevention, and uh, just it grieves my heart when this, these things happen, uh, and it, you know they're happening more and more. Unfortunately, I've noticed. Um, I was reading. I want to make sure I'll make this available for people. Maybe they can. Um, we can put it on the in the show notes, or maybe I'll give a link to your site where they can where you can get this. But you put together a very good blog post and a download that is very helpful. But one of the things um, that it says in your report is that suicide is a leading cause of death in the United States. It's the 10th leading cause of death, which is shocking. Yes, and that's based on a 2017 CDC report. 
about uh, about suicide, and it's really alarming. One of the things we see, one of the trends we're seeing, I feel, is that in uh, younger folks, there's a growing increase in that. There are a number of theories that are cause of that. One of those theories is that uh, the gener- there's a generational shift in resilience and being able to deal with difficulty, uh, and that there's not just that level of resilience here and being able to handle difficult situations. And that's certainly not saying that people are or gutless or wimp or anything like that. But what we're seeing is that uh, there, there's been a general eroding of people becoming resilient, being able to face adversity and push through things uh, in the States in the past uh, 10 to 15 years. That's interesting. I've felt that myself. I, I You know, and like a, like an older guy, sometimes I want to complain and grouse about, you know, quote unquote millennials or whatever, which isn't always fair, but it does feel like right. as a nation, regardless of our age, we're sort of, we're, we're becoming, I've, I've said it before, like we're becoming soft, but I see what you're saying. It's, it's sort of a lack or a loss of resilience that previous generations had before us. But when it comes to the church, I think this kind of thing really strikes a nerve because whether any of the listeners out there have heard of Jared Wilson or not, I mean, he was mm-hmm. he was um, a, a very influential leader in the church. He was a great speaker. Uh, I mean, he knew so many people, and he was a great guy. I, I didn't know him personally, but I knew people who knew him, and I knew of him. When, the, when this happens in the church, it sort of really causes a lot of people to either, you know, question Christianity, or sometimes they doubt their faith, or they ask questions like, well, how can a Christian, especially a Christian leader, you know, come to, you know, that kind of mental illness? What's What do you say to those folks, John? How do you respond to that? Well, I, I respond in a real mixed manner, Phil. Even as the news is developing over Jared's death, I saw a trend I've seen before, and it just really ticks me off, and that is people judging him, people saying, oh, if you had more faith, you wouldn't be depressed. People saying, oh, if you suicide, you're going to condemn yourself to hell. And it just really gets me chapped because uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things that we see in the church today is a real clear divide between Christians who are open and honest about dealing with mental illness and those who are more pharisaical and sadduceical about it. That, so, you know, Jesus is enough. I'm I like to take people back. I wrote a book a few years ago called The uh, Get a Grip on Depression, and it basically includes about seven Bible studies. And when I'm talking to Christians about depression, I, I take them to the Psalm 77. Great psalm. And the psalmist there is saying, when I think about you, O oh God, I groan. And as he goes in the first nine verses, he really spirals down. He says, you know, have you forgotten to be compassionate? Mm. Maybe your promises are true for everybody else but me. And as he spirals down in that depression, when he finally gets to the bottom of the barrel and he's picking, picking uh, splinters out of the bottom of the barrel, barrel, he went, but I remember the days of my youth. And so there is a recollection of when God touched his life. But I think what we've done in the church is we've either realized that part of living in a fallen universe is we have physical and mental illness. And those people that embrace that, I think, have a more healthy view of life. Those that pretend that want to pretend like, you know, that's not an issue in the church or just blind. Yeah. Tell you a quick story. When we first moved to Albuquerque 32 years ago, I was serving a large church here in town and my wife had her first really deep encounter with major depression. She was in a women's Bible study and one of the other staff wives was leading the Bible study. And I come up with Baptist heritage. So they were in Sunday school. And one morning she shared that she had been struggling with depression and she needed to go on medication for it. The Sunday school teacher at the class said, why don't you stay home and get better? You don't really need to be sharing that. Wow. So I have a wee bit of a uh, yeah. an issue with a lot of churches. And, uh, you know, there's a lack of understanding. I even read an article this moment about, you know, that this guy should have prayed away the demons of witchcraft and stuff. Makes my blood boil. Yeah. Now, you know, you and I were talking about kind of a theological thing. I think the church has built a theology of suicide based on King Saul and on Judas. Not the best two cases to look at that with. Exactly. I was actually thinking of this before, and where are the where are cases of suicide in the Bible? And those are the only two cases. And I think it's interesting because um, what, those aren't really even, the, I would say those are sort of like situational suicide yes, things. Yes. I mean, Saul was about to, to lose the battle anyway, and of course, 
There's controversy over what happened with Judas anyway, but that's for another podcast. Yeah, that's another topic. But really what, what what's in the Bible is very clear. I'm glad that you brought up the Psalms because David, I mean, it seems to me like David dealt with depression. I was talking with Sarah Robert, Robinson. I think you know Sarah. She's in the Tribe Writers. Oh, yeah. She's going to be on the podcast in a couple of weeks as well. She wrote a um, she wrote a blog post called "I Love Jesus, But I Want to Die." It went viral, and now she has a book coming out on it. And we were talking about King David and how, as you read through the Psalms, you see this glimpse of uh, of a Christian man, somebody who was described as a man after God's own heart, but seems like he struggled with depression. What do we do as a church? to change that idea of, of being able to share that. I've, I've shared with my congregation, and I think I've shared on the podcast, I have dealt with severe anxiety myself. I take antidepressant medication to help me deal with some of those things. I see a counselor. I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm just human. But I think a lot of people are ashamed to say that. So what are the steps? What do you think we can do as a church to, to change that so that people can come forward? You know, that's a great question, Phil. I think part of what we just have to do is is accept the fact that uh, we're all broken people. Right. You know, the beauty of the beauty of the gospel for me is there is nothing I can do to get God, I mean, you know, to, to earn God's favor. Whether I'm well or sick, whether I'm mentally well-adjusted or I'm a train wreck, he chooses to love me, warts and all. And I think in the church, what we want to do is we want to kind of give this good face that if you love Jesus, you're always happy. Things are always great. And that's kind of the lands of rainbows and unicorns. Yeah. Uh, And I'm kind of like, you know, the gritty truth is Jesus was a friend of sinners. And I'm glad I'm a friend of Jesus because I think what we've done in the American church is we've kind of made Christianity more of a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, successful uh, minded gospel where, you know, if you love Jesus, you'll have no problems, you'll be prosperous, and all things will be great. And that's just a bunch of malarkey. That is the truth. Hey, you know, I, we, I've talked about this a few times, but I agree. I think one of the problems in the evangelical church is that Jesus is sort of uh, sold as, a, um, as some kind of a fix, like a quick fix or something. And, and obviously, when it comes to your sin and salvation— Jesus does fix that. It, the blood, His blood washes away our sin, cleanses us, allows us to have fellowship with God. But we're still subject to human imperfection, and mental illness is a disease. It's a sickness. It's something that, um, that people wrestle with. It doesn't mean you're less of a person. One of the things in uh, your um, download here is you have some do's and you have some don'ts. And I would love to, to talk through some of those because— I believe a lot of people, they don't know, they don't react the right way because they don't know how to react. And I think this is helpful. You say, don't argue with someone who's suicidal. Avoid saying things like, your suicide will hurt your family. Why is that important? Well, you know, when you're talking to someone, and and I've I've got over 53,000 hours in the counselor's chair, so my perspective's a little bit different. But when I first came out of grad school, we were always kind of, you kind of asked the can't see the question kind of in the oblique. You know, have you ever thought about maybe ending your life? As I've gotten older and maybe grumpier and maybe more realistic, now when I sit with a client, I'll just look him in the eye and say, when was the last time you felt like killing yourself? Mm. And you know what's amazing? Mm. People have thought about the past three or four weeks to say, well, Thursday, two weeks ago. Right, they know. Now, rather than freaking out and going, oh my gosh, we got to call 911, I go, well, so Thursday, two weeks ago. Well, it's been two weeks. So what got you through that? So immediately, rather than than piling on the suicidal thing, if they're telling me, when I say, well, so what got you through that? They may say something like, I thought about my kids. I thought about my wife. They're not suicidal right now. So what I do at that point, to feel as I say, man, you're an incredible person. In that dark moment, you thought of something to give you strength. So I immediately jump on the strength thing. Yeah. And then you'll find many times they immediately relax and say, yeah, but boy, I'm going through a tough time. Then they are talking to you and you can find out what's going on. Right. And so, so many times we're scared to ask about it. And I've just found, just ask, <laughs> just roll it out there. If, you know, if they get offended, well, that's, 
Well, I think I, I like what you're saying. I, you know, in the response to Jared's suicide, uh, you know, I'm just looking through Twitter and on Facebook and many people n- knew him. And uh, what is interesting to me is how many people uh, said something like, I wish I would have said something or I wish, you know, I, I, I could have known. And I think what you're saying is it's OK to be direct in love and say, you know, like this is a big deal. This is an important thing we're going to talk about. Why? Why? You know, why uh, pretend that it's not happening? You can ask somebody directly. I mean, I think obviously if you know them well enough and if you have a relationship and if there's some trust there. Sure. Now, you also say don't promise confidentiality. So talk about that for a second. Sure, and I'm a licensed professional therapist, and we have two requ- well, three required reportables. If someone threatens harm to self, harm to someone else, so they're using kids. Years ago, I was leading a Bible study at church, and this, this single male said, well, I want to share something in confidence. So I said, well, if you're facing tell me you're suicidal, there is no confidentiality. Right. There are no secrets. Well, he told me. Then that night, he got a phone call from the police department. There was a SWAT situation, and they were at his house, and I saw him. He had to go to the hospital for four days. So when I saw him at church two weeks later, he had some unkind references to my family of origin, like to the canine family. <laughs> and I smiled at him and I said, you know what? I don't care how ticked off you are at me. I'm glad you're alive to be angry. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Later on, he came back. He says, I hated you, but I love you for being so straight. And I said, well, you know what? I've lost three people in all my years of counseling. Mm to suicide. They were all former clients, but um, I, I don't apologize for it. And, and you know, one of the things I was reading the other day, and this actually came out of Charisma New, uh, and I thought it was an interesting insight. They said, you know, the devil's number one tactic, tactic for driving a Christian suicide is to help promote the idea that Satan loves to tell Pete believers that they are not good Christians for having dark thoughts. Mm. And depression, they just better shut up. You know, I really believe that. The scripture says that Satan is an accuser of the brethren. Now, I also believe that someone who's suicidally depressed is not in their right mind. But when you look at that verse about the accuser of the brethren, it says they overcame the accuser by two things. By the blood of the Lamb, and that means the finished work of Christ that you and I discussed earlier, Mm -hmm. but also the word of their testimony. And to me, the word of their testimony is that, that constantly updated word that God's doing in her life, that yes, I'm depressed, but he's helping me through this. Yes, I struggle with depression. I've got people in my life. Yes, I struggle with depression and anxiety, but I've got good doctors that are helping with medication and things like that. And so we need to acknowledge depression. We need to be there for our friends without judgment, but we also need to be peddlers of hope. Hi, I'm Sophie Ayers, Pastor Phil's daughter. I love Faith Box. I've always loved receiving gifts and getting a monthly gift that is focused around Jesus is all I could ask for. Faith Box is a Christian community designed to help you stay centered in Christ with devotionals, inspired content, and hand-picked products that do good. I absolutely love getting my Faith Box every month. If you like getting gifts or need to get a gift for someone else, you can get Faith Box for as low as $22 a month. And it's worth it. Go to philairs.me slash faithbox or click the link in the show notes. Now, I've had some experience with losing someone close to me. My best friend's son took his life a couple of years ago. He was a young man I considered like a nephew. And the ripple waves of that um, suicide, I mean, it feels like they never go away. It is a profound, profound uh uh, weight uh, on everybody. And I often find myself trying to figure out how to reach out to my friend and to his family. Don't always know what to say. And I think in the church, if there is somebody who has uh, experience with suicide and somebody has suicided close to them, the, the people in the church often don't know what to say. What's your suggestion or what's your advice to them? Well, first of all, sometimes it's completely okay to say, I don't know what to say. Hmm. Other times, it's like, uh, so, so many times we in the church think we have to have the right words. Yeah. Sometimes the best thing you can do is sit with someone in silence. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Um, 
you probably know this because you have experience as a chaplain, but uh, they, I believe they call that the ministry of presence. It's just being yeah, ministry of presence. Just being present. And so if you're out there and listening and you know somebody who's gone through this uh, or or is going through this, you don't have to have the right spiritual words. And And probably the last thing you need to do is to, you know, dig up a Bible verse, you know. Yeah, excuse me, particularly Romans 8, 28. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the time for that kind of encouragement may come uh, in, in different uh, in different ways. But I mean, th- at that moment, uh, and, and I suppose this, you know, counts for a lot of different tragedies that people go through. You, you don't always need to have the words. Um, you need to be there. And sometimes being there in silence uh, is more powerful, or I'd say most of the time it's more powerful than trying to, you know, come up with aphorism or the right thing to say. Now, what about if we have someone listening right now that has suicidal thoughts, is dealing with depression, um, hasn't been able to share that with anybody just due to the shame involved or if they're a Christian, what words would you say to them and what resources might be available for somebody who's dealing with suicide? Well, number one, you need to talk to someone about it, a trusted friend, uh, maybe a pastor, maybe a therapist, or, uh, and Phil, you, you may have the numbers right there in front of you since you have the, the document. You can call or text the National Suicide Hotline. They have people who can help. Focus on the Family has a number you can call to help. And let me, let me just share with you a little bit of the guideline I use to help people. I, I did this talk last year to about 1,500 young people from Texas. When you're talking to someone about suicide, you don't have to be a clinician to do an assessment. But think about the acronym or the mnemonic SLAP, S-L-A-P. And I'll have a class on this in a couple of weeks. The S is how serious does the uh, plan sound? If they say, some days I just don't want to live, that's serious, but it may not be time to hit the panic button. Mm -hmm. So S is how serious. L is lethality. So if you were to kill yourself, how would you do it? If they say, well, I don't know. That's probably a really lower threshold. If they say, I've got pills and weapons, then you should be paying really full attention, maybe thinking about getting some help, calling some, you know, maybe calling 911. So S is seriousness. L is lethality. A is the access to the means or the method. So let's just call this person Frank. So Frank, you tell me you're suicidal. If you were going to do this, how would you do it? Well, I have weapons at the house or I have medication. At this point in time, the flag should go from yellow to red, and you should be really serious with them, but you should be getting someone to maybe contact 911. P in SLAT is proximity. If they're around other people, or if you can be with them on the phone, or if you can go visit them, or if they can be plugged into someone else, that's the cheapest, quickest way to help someone de-escalate. Not to, quote, talk them down, but to be present with them, because so many times... If they're connected and talking to someone, that can lower that risk. So when you're talking to someone, you want to use that little acronym SLAP. Yeah. How serious does this sound? How lethal is it? They have access and proximity. Let me just say this. If anybody's listening, I'll give you that number. The National Suicide Hotline number is 800-273-TALK. That's 800-273-8255. Or you can text... Um, eight three eight two five five, and um, and and talk with somebody right away. And I have some other numbers and some other resources that I'm going to put on the on the uh, in the show notes. But let me just also say, if you're listening and you're somebody who has felt that you um, you've thought about taking your life, um, number one, that doesn't mean you're not a good Christian. God does still love you. Jesus did die for you. It doesn't mean you're a failure. I love, I love what you said there, John. Uh, Satan is the accuser, and he would love to accuse people of not being good enough for God's grace. And then the second thing, like John said, uh, find someone to talk to and get some help. And uh, I think as a church, this is something that we have to change. We have to be able to talk about this openly and sort of remove the cloak of uh, of fear and shame, so that people um, so that people can get help. Now, I know uh, John, you're working on some things. You mentioned a, a video course, I think that you have. Why don't you tell us where we can find 
more information about what you do, whether that has to do with suicide prevention or other things. Well, thanks, Bill. There are two ways you can kind of find out what I do and who I am. You can go to my website, which is John Thurman, J-O-H-N-T-H-U-R-M-A-N dot net. Right now, when you go there, you'll have a page that basically has some, a tip sheet for marriages. Or you can go to, you can actually text us. I'm going to give you a text. You can get on our email list. And get on the email list. We'll let you know what's coming up and when it's coming. It's kind of the who, what, when, where, why. And so if you're on your cell phone right now, just text the word suicide prevention, one word, suicide prevention. Text that word to 33777. So type suicide prevention to 33777. That will put you on my email list. That will give you this handout that Phil and I are talking about on suicide awareness and prevention. And that way you'll be able to keep up with all that's going on in my part of the world. Well, thanks, John, for being on the podcast. And thanks for sharing what you know. I I hope that it's encouraging to people. I'm going to put all these uh, links in the show notes as well. Let's stay in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks and God bless, my friend. Well, that's all we have for today. Thanks for listening to the Bible Revealed podcast. Remember, if there's one thing that you can do to help spread the truth of God's Word, consider helping us by going to iTunes or Spotify and leaving a short five-star review. And also, share the podcast with a friend. Maybe somebody you know needs a little extra encouragement. Or maybe somebody would like to also go deeper into the world word and you would like to help them by sharing the podcast just let them know where they can find it the podcast is on itunes and spotify stitcher google it's just about everywhere so search for the bible revealed podcast by the way you can find us on facebook as well and so we hope to see you there today's show is brought to you by the bible revealed it is a ministry of the past media group the show was recorded at the lost dog studio in orlando florida written and recorded by me phil ayers edited and mixed by the impeccable Tony Holmes. Our producer is the indefatigable Dylan Kreienbrink. I don't even know what that means, but I think it's good. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time on The Bible Revealed.